Armenian village, this place would have dated back to, say, 1200 BC. And look at these walls here. Uh, they are huge, they are strong. Uh, this would have been the technology of the day for a fortified city. And uh, what makes this significant is, uh, say, in the day of of, of the Exodus. Remember, this would have been around the same period, 1200, 1400 BC. Uh, this probably would have been similar to the very walls of Jericho that the 12 spies were, were sent in to see, you know, during the Israelite exile, going into Canaan, and all of a sudden they come up to Jericho and see these massive walls here. These, this isn't even full height, the 10 meters, and that's how tall they were. And uh, surely they said, these walls are impenetrable, we can't possibly get into this city. Well, this would have been the similar sort of layout. Uh, and after you got a few boulders to the head, uh, maybe a vat of boiling oil in your back, and a few arrows to the arm, you too might think, hey, I don't think we can take this city. But hey, why not march around and pull out a trumpet on the seventh day, right? That'll work. Anyways, yeah, amazing stuff here. Uh, and this really gives us just a better understanding of the technology of uh, the biblical time. Okay, so another interesting aspect about being here in this Mycenaean village is the fact that uh, we don't know, this is one of the great mysteries of Greek antiquity, is we don't fully understand why this fortified, this very well fortified city fell. Now, some pr uh, propose that it was a civil insurrection. The people, the majority, the 90% of the people, were very upset and of their oppression, and so they rose up against the aristocrats of their day and overcame this city here. Uh, interesting theory makes the most sense because we don't read of in any enemies of Greece or the early Greeks, the My Mycenaeans at this time, and uh, certainly uh, after you kill off the aristocrats, the one that can read and write, any civilization would have gone into a dark ages, and that's exactly what takes place here. We see a, a, a real hindrance towards any sort of technological advancement, writing, art, uh, literature, all these things really come to a halt, and it's because most of the aristocrats were probably killed in the very battle that took place on this land. However, 400 years later, uh, the Greeks rise up again, and they continue to preserve this language, which would soon lay the foundation for the New Testament and with uh, Alexander's conquest of all the known world at the time up to India, this would have laid the platform for the gospel and the proclamation to the ends of the earth. Okay, so here we are at one of the Mycenaean ruins. This is called a beehive tomb right behind me. This would have been built in 1400 BC. That's 1400 with a BC. Just amazing that it has survived. Uh, truly a remarkable archaeological find. And you can see the proportions of this structure in comparison to the people walking in and out of the tomb door. Now, just to give you an insight of how uh, really technologically advanced these people were, they weren't some sort of Neanderthals crawling around on their knees, nor did those people ever exist. But anyways, that's another hobby horse. This right here, look at that heifer. Could you imagine moving that rock? And then take a look at this, the lintel there above the doorway. That thing weighs 120 tons. Somehow, these men in 1400 BC got that stone up there to guard the archway of the Via. Absolutely amazing technology. We still fully don't understand how they did it. I propose this magnetic force. All right. Okay, we're going down into a uh, cistern. This would have been, uh, again, a 14th century Mycenaean uh, tunnel here. And a uh, cistern is where people actually go to get water. A well is where you would, well, you would drop a bucket down to get water. So come on, let's take a look at this place. It is approximately a hundred some steps down. And uh, you can see they actually chiseled into these walls using the uh, Mycenaean triangle beehive shape. As usual with a nice little uh, lanthole here for the overhead weight-bearing stuff.
Okay, so we are now in the bottom of the cistern, and this area here behind me, and Dave, you can kind of shine a light down there. This would have been where people would have gathered the water. And something else is really neat about these walls is, again, these walls were, this is not a natural cavern or cave. This was actually carved into by the Mycenaeans. So, David, maybe you can kind of scope across of what we're looking at here. But we are 60 feet deep into the Earth's surface right now, and uh, the Mycenaeans just kept digging until they found water. He who farts in church will sit in his own pew. I think the same goes for the Mycenaean tombs. All right, uh, we are here at the world's oldest bridge. This is the Mycenaean Bridge, equivalent to our bridge to nowhere, it looks like, but apparently it's a bridge to somewhere. The significance of this bridge is that it's the oldest bridge in the world. That's all we got. here right outside of a fourth century theater it would be called the theater of Escaladon and I'm probably mispronouncing that but uh, it's Greek it's all Greek to me so uh, anyways this theater is remarkable because it apparently has the most precise acoustics in all the world even today it is yet to be replicated with such accuracy so for all you math majors out there here's a great practical use of your degree you too can create theaters that have precision acoustics well, let's go in and test the theory All right, well, you saw it for yourself. That theater is pretty impressive. I could hear uh, John singing uh, from 110 steps away. That theater could have sat literally thousands of people, and each one of them could have heard as though they were sitting on the front row. All of this taking place in the fourth century. These people were brilliant, and this would have been the, the early church setting. So here we are at the Temple of Escalaton. Uh, it's right here behind me. Uh, this would have been the temple where the yellow snake, the mystical yellow snake, would have been kept in the basement. And uh, people would have come to this place to be healed. Now what they do is they would ritually cleanse, them, cleanse themselves. They would then go and see the priest. After gaining his advice, they would either stay here for the night or go home. If they stay here for the night, hundreds of them, uh, and I don't know how many came, but hundreds of them are depicted in stone saying that as they fell asleep, they had a dream of one of these mystical yellow snakes coming up and kissing them and that they were completely healed. Uh, this would include the blind now being able to see and the deaf being able to hear. So all this took place right here at this very mystical and ancient spot. All right, so what to do with mythical uh, snakes that heal people? Well, this would have been the challenge for the early church and, since, and, and surely the Israelites as well. Again, this is fourth century BC. Uh, Israel at this time period is in the 400 silent years. They're wondering where is God and they're in captivity. But God, of course, is paving the way providentially for the Messiah that would come and rescue all people from their sins and bring about the revelation of the true God that alone could heal. Now, uh, in the Bible, we clearly see multiple times people being healed or signs and wonders. I'm sorry, we see signs and wonders being done in a name that was not that of the God Most High, Yahweh himself. If you remember the Pharaoh and his magic men, so to speak, when Moses threw down his staff, it became a snake, and sure enough, the uh, Pharaoh's magic magicians were able to throw down their staff as well, and it became a snake. So, you know, mystical snake handling, it's uh, known throughout the ancient world. Uh, these would have been what I believe are called demonic forces, and um, they might have healed people, they might not. But the end result was, was that when Christ came, he clearly stood against any sort of pagan perversion of the reality that there is one true God and he alone can heal for eternity.